especially at this time when we come together at church to worship. Uh, it's such a great thing that we have our brothers and sisters whom we can worship together with, and I'm glad that we're doing this, um, this greeting thing. Thank you, Grace. Um, so, uh, Pastor Steve is absent today because he is currently in Toronto. Yeah, I see uh, DJ's eyes lightening up as soon as I say Toronto. Uh, he's leading a revival uh, there, so he, he'll be, he's preaching for three consecutive days. Today's the last day. He'll be returning tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, please pray for him that he would be able to wrap up the whole revival in God's grace. And um, so for those who might be uh, wondering where I was last week, I was next door <laughs> preaching to the KM congregation. Um, and I was able to hear you guys praising. And, you know, always, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of a hope that a uh, wish that uh, the, the, the praise sound was louder, like uh, we have quite a lot of people, and I was wondering, where, 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 where's, where's all the sound? Where, why, why are people not singing out loud? But we'll, we'll leave that for uh, later, uh, for a um, later discussion. But uh, anyways, uh, one more um, announcement is that uh, Solomon Lee, who is our children's ministry director, He's been ordained. Uh, he sh shortly visited Korea, and he has been ordained as a pastor. Please pray for him, for as we all know, uh, being a pastor is walking on a very narrow path, and he needs all our prayers as much as I need your prayer. So please keep him, keep him in your prayers. Um, and one correction concerning the infant baptism. So uh, this... Coming So next week, uh, we will have Remy and Levi being baptized, but instead of Olivia, it's going to be Zane, um, Esther and Tony's um, third child. So uh, just be aware of that. All right. Um, today, the passage that we're going to be reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 9, all the way to... 39. I know it's a long passage, but we will read through the whole passage. Uh, it's on page four, 495 on the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 9 to 39. This is the word of the Lord. Now Israel had fled every man to his own home. And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, uh, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Uh, why then should you be the last to bring, the, bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me, and more also if you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, Return, both you and all your servants. So the king came back to the, to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the, ben, the Benjaminite from Behurim hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and his 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the, crossed the ford to bring over the king's household and to do his pleasure. 
And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan and said to the king, Let not my lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my lord the king. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? But David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am, the, I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes, from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? He answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me, for your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself, that I may ride on it and go with the king. For your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. Um, but my lord, the king, is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were but men doomed. Uh, men doomed to death before my lord the king. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? And the king said to him, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have deceived. I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, Oh, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely home. Now Barzillai, the, Gilead, the Gileadite, had come down from Rogelim, and he went on with the king of the Jordan to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was a, a very aged man, 80 years old. He had provided the king with food while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to Barzillai, Come over with me, and I will provide for you with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, How many years have I still to live, that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day eighty years old. Can I discern that? Uh, can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant return, that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant Chimham. Let him go over with my lord the king and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me, and I will go for him whatever seems good to you. I will do for him whatever seems good to you, and all that you desire of me I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and the king went over. And the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own home. The king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went on with him. All the people of Judah and also half the people of Israel brought the king on his way. Let me say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessings. We ask that you would penetrate into our hearts with the very sword of the Holy Spirit. May your work be vivid as we read through this passage. And may our hearts be turning to you, seeing Christ Jesus within the passage and upholding you as our Lord 
and as a, as a Savior. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Wow, it, it is really different to be standing so close to you guys. I can now literally read your facial expression, every detail. So, uh, yeah, those who, yeah, you won't be able to zone out because I'm going to be staring at you. <laughs> um, but yeah, now I get to understand why Pastor Steve enjoys so much uh, preaching down here. Um, so, uh, we are at the 19th page of 2 Samuel, and at this point, the nation of Israel has been in turmoil up to, up to this point for quite a while, right? And people were uh, divided into two groups, uh, basically some uh, people who are supporting Absalom, uh, David's son, and those who are supporting David. But now... David has won the final battle. We read that in the previous chapter, chapter 18, if you have been following our reading schedule. And as a result, Absalom is killed. And that incident itself was a, was a sad incident. It was a sad victory that David so wanted to avoid. But at the same time, we must acknowledge that this was the result that straightened out ongoing messiness that has been in our passages up to this point. People have been struggling and confused um, whom they should be serving as their own king. Now remember what Ahithophel said when he came up with a tactic to assassinate David. Uh, you guys remember that he had a plan uh, not to deal with the whole army, but just to assassinate David, and that would be the solution. And this is what Ahithophel said, I will strike down only the king and I will bring all the people back to you, you meaning Absalom, as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man and all the people, all the people will be at peace. Now Ahithophel's uh, intention was evil as we all know, but he clearly understood what people's agony was, being caught between the two kings. Now that Absalom is gone, the problem is solved. David is the only option given to all these people. Now, people just need to come to him like a bride, as it was described in the passage that I just read for you, as brides coming to their husband. The perfect condition for the peace, the shalom, that only God can provide, is now set. And the people just need to take the action. The situation, however, is not simple. That's what has been explained through our passage today. Now look at verse 9. Apparently, all the tribes of Israel, pretty much everyone, every single one, is now turning to David, they know he is the one and only that he is the only appropriate person for the currently empty throne of Israel. So see how they address David. They, they, they address David as the king. So if you look at verse 9, it says, The king, the king delivered us. This is a reflection of the people of Israel calling David as the king, the one and only the king delivered us from the hand of Philist the Philistines, and now he has fled out the land from Absalom. Now that Absalom is gone, people are bringing back that very memory, what the true king is, who he is. And David has done a lot for them, and they are being reminded through this reflection what he has done for them. He was the king who brought them salvation from the enemy, the Philistines. But in the following verse 10, you see all the baggages of guiltiness people are carrying with them. And they say, but Absalom, whom we anointed over us. This simple phrase 
is telling us that they are clearly aware of what they have done. They themselves are the ones who enthroned the rebel, the king's enemy, David's enemy, even though he was the son of David as their own king. This guiltiness has been weighing on their minds. And this is not something that is unfamiliar to all of us, right? For this has been the constant struggle, the struggle that has been started ever since Adam and Eve first enthroned something else or someone else than the true king, enthroning, worshiping something else than our true king, whether it be yourself, themselves, or something that they admire in their lives. This is what the Bible calls idolatry. Romans 1 explains this as exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things or whatever you can name it. Something that is not God is being the replacement for God. Sadly, all sinners, including ourselves, struggle with this severely. And the people of Israel in our passage were no exception. Because of such guiltiness, they have not been able to address the elephant in the room. They were not asking the proper question, who should be our king? And after David's complete victory over Absalom, people are finally, now finally, breaking their silence and throwing that question that they should have asked earlier, as we see in verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? The king, again, the king, pointing to David. Now, if you understand the logistics of wars, what you see here should be Astonishing, should be a surprise for you. David could have just marched into Jerusalem and forcefully reigned over Judah and the nation of Israel, for he is the one who has won the battle. This is what happens in most wars. The winner takes it all. David had all the rights to declare his kingship over this nation, especially given that he is not newly gaining, but regaining what he used to own previously, the kingship, the throne that used to be his, he is now regaining it. Yet, he does not do so. Instead, he carefully approaches the leadership of Judah, basically saying, when everyone in this nation is speaking of my return as your king, so everyone's just talking about me be becoming the king again, how come? How come you as the leaders of this nation, how come you guys are still stagnant? He says, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his own house? Now you see here, this is what is so great about the scene. I love the scene because of this reason. David understands. He truly understands the burden the weight that these people had, the guilt pressing upon the hearts of these leaders, David understood, and he takes initiative. This is why he takes that action first. When people were hesitating, he took action. And he encourages them and reminds them that they need not hesitate anymore in coming to him. He's basically just saying, come to me. Come to me. I know you have all these burdens. I know a lot of things are going in your mind and you're not ready to come maybe, but just come because I am ready for you. And David does this in an unprecedented way. His return to kingship is a process of reconciliation. Take a look at verse 13. He appoints his enemy's uh, commander, uh, the, his, his enemy's commander-in-chief, Amasa, as the new commander-in-chief for his new nation. 
This is unheard of. If there is any reason to do this, well, it's, it's barely uh, possible to find any reason, but if there is something fit for Amasa, it would be execution rather than having him as the chief leader of David's own nation. Now, the once divided nation is now coming together by this effort of David trying to reconcile the whole nation to him. David, swaying the heart of all the people of Judah as one man, as it is described in verse 14. Now, friends, I don't think you need lengthy explanations that our lives are complicated. I do not know exactly, probably I don't know the details of all the baggages and all the struggles that you carry, um, but what I can say is that that struggle, that baggage that you have is much more complicated than we would like it to be. That's what the passage is showing us. We think gospel should be straightforward, right? We think because of that straightforwardness, it should be straightening all our issues and make our lives clearer and easier, right? Well, the gospel does make things clear to us when the Holy Spirit illumines to us the truth concerning Christ Jesus. But this does not necessarily mean our lives will look simpler. Some of us may struggle with our guilt concerning our sinful past, and some may be currently, even now, struggling with idolatry. It could be money, it could be fame, education, profession that you admire, your kids, your spouse, you can name it. Or for some, it may be pornography or alcohol or drugs, something that you are addicted to and just can't do away with it. When these things take over the throne that is meant to be for our God, the guilt of sin enormously weighs on us. It becomes impossible to break the silence and come to the king to whom this throne belongs. David himself, suffering with that kind of a struggle, mentions in Psalm 32 that his bones were wasting away. It was that painful as he continued to keep silent before the Lord. He was struggling with his sins. But the good news is our Father God knows the complicatedness of our lives and all the baggages and guilt that we carry. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, all who labor and are heavy laden come to me. He understands what is weighing in our hearts. And this is why in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it describes him as the great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. And this is not merely just some kind of emotional sympathizing. Jesus sympathizes with our struggles inside out because he himself, he himself was tempted in every respect during his life on earth and yet was without sin. He has conquered sin not only throughout his life here, but especially on that very cross so that you and I may be able to come before him. That you and I may be given the same victory that he has accomplished day in and day out. Brothers and sisters, this victory is what frees us from that baggage of guilt because of our Lord who not only understands and is patient in his guidance, pulling us out of the darkness and leading us into the light of Christ Jesus, there is finally, for all of us, hope that cannot be found anywhere. Because that very patience, that very patience that leads us to see his love the love 
of God that has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus because of that hesed love, that love and kindness of his. Because that is what reigns over all complicatedness of this world and our lives, we finally have hope. He would not mind kindly and patiently walking with us. Jesus would not mind walking with us no matter how slow we are as long as he can show us that heart of his. As long as he can show us that very victory that he has and the victory that he is handing to us. He has overcome the pang of death and defeated sin by taking away all our sins and receiving all the penalties, all the punishment unto death. Namely, the wrath of God is what he himself carried and received. This is how he has won this victory for us. And this is how he gave us that very victory because of this you and I draw near to God's throne with confidence as we do today to worship the Lord. And this gives us all the reason to be joyful and to shout out to the Lord as we worship him with all our voices, with all our hearts, committing ourselves to the Lord who has poured on us this very love. Brothers and sisters, this is how we have come to worship our Lord. And if anyone in this room feels distant from God, whether it be that you never receive Christ as your Savior, which I think is possible, or you are, even though you have received him as your Savior, still struggling so much in your life with the guilt issue concerning your sin that you have lost track of that last moment you rejoiced in the Lord. You don't even remember when you had this relationship with the Lord because you have been staying so away from him due to your inner struggles. Let me tell you this. The Lord, our God, has already initiated his move towards you. You might not have acknowledged it, but he has already initiated that move. He has chosen you before eternity, and he has led you up to this point. The only reason you are here worshiping him is because of his initiation. Nothing else but that being the only reason. And you know what? Even in the midst of your hesitation, even in the midst of our sinfulness. The scripture tells us that this salvation came to us when we were his enemies. And the passage is telling us that through those struggles, when we think God is distant from us, his good work is present with us. He is patiently waiting for you even in the midst of all your difficulties. And Matthew chapter 12 and verse 20, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until, until he brings his work, the work of justice to victory. And this is what our Lord truly wants to show us through this passage that no matter what struggle we have, that we have all the right to come before him. Not, only, not because of anything that we have, but because of who he is. He's the God who is patient and who so wantingly wants you to come to him in Christ Jesus. Now, if you look at the latter half of today's passage, you see three controversial characters. What I've just explained up to this point sets the tone of how we should be viewing these three characters. The reason why I call this 
controversial characters is because so many people, so many commentaries have been mentioning on these three characters because they themselves don't really know exactly what's going on. Especially concerning Shimei and Mephibosheth. I'm sure while you were reading, you also were confused, right? Are they good characters? Why are they evil? You know, there are some gray areas uh, that actually confuses us. And what I think is that instead of putting too much focus on discerning whether these guys are good or bad, we should be focusing on these characters, uh, what, what these characters are trying to tell us. These, because these characters are basically pointing us to see God's own character. The focus is not to discern whether these, are, these guys are good or not, but God is reflecting himself, his own character to us through these characters. And I think these three people, three men, all have their goods and their bads, like all of us. And their story with David reflects this. And this is not something that we should be discouraged about. I know some of you might be uh, who were having high expectation for Mephibosheth after reading this passage might be a little bit disappointed. But as a matter of fact, the, 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 the reality, the contour of these characters that are shown here, it becomes an encouragement to us. Why? Because this mimics our own reality that we're living in, our own characters. We ourselves are pretty complicated beings. And depending on which side of your life uh, you are viewing or someone is viewing uh, about your life, there could be different interpretations on who we are. And I, I think this passage very successfully uh, depicts that. So, but still, we should take a look at these uh, three men. So, starting from Shimei, from the very first verse, 16. As soon as the tide is turned, as soon as David seems to be uh, the, the next to be enthroned, and everything seems to be in favor of David, we see Shimei with his servants and sons rushing down to Jerusalem. He's in a hurry. Why? Because he wants to meet David. And this actually makes us scratch our heads because we've already encountered Shimei in chapter 16, right? If you remember chapter 16, he's the man of Saul's family. And he was the one who was cursing David. You remember that? He was cursing David as David was running away. And not only that, he was also throwing stones at him. Thus, our views on this character, is, it's pretty skeptical. You know, we're not sure what he is intending. Yet, he does come to a moment in verse 18 and 19. As he comes down to his knees, he's saying, Let not my Lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my Lord the King left Jerusalem. So he's referring to that incident when he was cursing David and he's asking for forgiveness. And he says, do not let the king take it to heart. This sounds kind of naive, right? Given what he has done. I mean, he was cursing the king and now he's saying, you know, I just happen to, you know, I, I just normally curse anyone who passes by and you were going, you were running away and uh, I just bumped into you so I was cursing you. And you know, I, I normally throw stones at people. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really make sense, but that's what he's saying. Um, but still, we need to pay attention uh, to something that is described in this passage, uh, which is verse 19. We must acknowledge that there is still a moment of repentance here. Because uh, Shimei admits that 
he has sin. He literally says, I have sin. And he comes to his knees before the king, whom he humiliated before. To be honest, uh, we don't know if Shimei is just trying to save his own life because he knows power, uh, you know, David will be in power. Uh, I mean, this could have been a fake gesture. Um, who knows? I mean, there's no further explanation here, especially consider considering his last words for his son Solomon. And if you, if you take a look at 1 Kings chapter 2, there is this uh, last word of David to his son Solomon. And what he says is, this is what he says, See, there is with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjam Benjaminite of Behurim. It was he who spoke bad words against me on the day I went to Mahanaim. So I don't know. It sounds like, yes, he forgave um, Shimei, but he still has that bitterness in his heart. Um, but then what he says is, but when he came down to me at the Jordan, I promised him by the Lord saying, I will not put you to death with a sword. So he's mentioning that he has forgiven him. And then what follows is, he says, so do not let him go without being punished. Isn't that interesting? So what's not reflected here in 1 Kings, it's telling us that David does not trust this guy, even though he forgave him. Because he says, but you are a wise man to Solomon, he says. You will know what to do with him. But do not let him go without being punished. So David is speaking of the righteousness that has to be executed. And he actually says, bring Shimei's gray hair down to the grave with blood. Right? So he's thinking about having Shimei executed to death. It is, hardly, it is kind of hard to precisely uh, describe Shimei's character here, but something is sketchy. We do acknowledge, but we do not have detailed info on this again. So instead of trying to read too much into what's going on here, I think it's more appropriate to focus on what is sure in this passage. David forgive Shimei no matter what. That's what is sure here. And what, what uh, empowers that argument is that Abishai, um, who is his um, general, Abishai actually confronts uh, this, this guy and says, you know, this guy should be killed. But David, despite that confrontation of Abishai, he still forgives Shimei, this unconditional grace is given and shown to Shimei by David. So what we see through the two different characters, Abishai and David, is that Abishai brings in the law of God condemning Shimei to accomplish righteousness and justice. He wants to kill Shimei for what he has done. But David... As the true king, he forgives. This is what Christ, our true king, does. The king of kings and lord of lords, he forgives the sinners. He forgives you and me at the price of his own blood. He forgives us no matter what. He came to us not to condemn us, even though he has all the right to do so and we have we deserve that, but what he does is he saves us. He saves us instead of condemning us. And John chapter 3, verse 16, he says, well, it says, For God did not send his son Jesus into this world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this is the king that we have. Now, turning to Mephibosheth, there is this unsolved riddle ever since you have read chapter 16. Because in that passage, um, Mephibosheth's servant, Ziba, 
he reports uh, something, uh, he, he gives an ill report concerning his master, Mephibosheth, to David. And that Mephibosheth, you know, uh, uh, Ziba says, Mephibosheth remained in Jerusalem instead of joining David's crew because he thinks he will, at a certain point, regain the kingdom of his father Saul. Now, based on what Mephibosheth says in verse 26 of today's passage, Ziba, it seems like Ziba has clearly deceived him and gave ill report to David about his master. But who knows? I mean, we don't know the details. Maybe Mephibosheth was not telling the truth. We do not know if this guy is a trustworthy guy. Yet, there are some clues that tells us that maybe we do want to trust this guy, give more credit to him. For Mephibosheth, ever since meeting David, this is what it says in verse 24, he had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. So this is not a description of Mephibosheth's styling or his sanity. But what this verse is telling us is that Mephibosheth, his heart for David, is true. Mephibosheth, ever since he met David when he was suffering, when he was running away from Absalom, he did not want to be in comfort. He wanted to join the suffering of David with him by not washing, by not um, putting his body in a comfortable situation. And that's what's reflected here. And we can also track in verse 28 that Mephibosheth is well aware of the grace that he received from David. So if you take a look at verse 28, it says, For all my father's house were but men doomed, men doomed to death before my lord the king, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? So Mephibosheth is aware that he deserves death as the son, the relative of Saul before King David, but that he has received this grace, not only just being alive, but he has been given this privilege to eat at the table of David. And this is what our king does. This is what the character of Mephibosheth is trying to reflect about the king that he serves. This king is merciful. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to be dining with him at the very feast, which is depicted in the very last book of our Bible. When that day comes, when Christ Jesus comes, when we finally get to see the new heaven and new earth, there will be this banquet of the Lamb where we will all, the people of God, clothed in white, will rejoice. And still, this Mephibosheth, what's surprising is, even though Ziba gave an ill report to the king, he still cares for him. When David wasn't sure who to trust, he was thinking, oh, should I? Well, he does revoke, uh, he does uh, revoke his initial call that he gave to Ziba, and he divides the land into half, giving half to Mephibosheth, half to Ziba. This is a reflection that he's not sure who's the right guy. But he returns, well, but, but what, what we see clearly here is that even at this moment, Mephibosheth, in verse 30, what does he say? He says, let Ziba take everything. I don't need that half. Take everything. And there's something that tells us that Mephibosheth, his satisfaction does not come from the land, does not come from the property he owns. It comes from this moment that he's enjoying with the king. And lastly, let's turn to Bar Barzillai. He was a rich man, and he unconditionally provided the food, the needs that David had when he was in trouble, 
And David rightly uh, rewards him in verse 33. Yet, something interesting happens. David is offering Barzillai the greatest reward that is existing in this kingdom, which is to be with the king. Isn't that kind of an irony? Because in the previous uh, passage, um, what we saw uh, from Mephibosheth is he, he is enjoying this moment with his king. And at this moment, David is offering that presence of his with Barzillai, the Barzillai turns that down. Verse 37, it says, Please let your servant return, that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Chimham. Let him go over with my lord, the king, and do for him whatever seems good to you. So what do we see here? What are we finding here in this comment? Barzillai, his content, he's not, his satisfaction is not coming from what David rewards. Yes, we do see that being with him is his pleasure, but he is looking towards something beyond the gift that David is showing. He's looking forward to the moment that he will be rejoicing in the new heaven and new earth. That is why he's content, even when he's offered of this great reward by the king. And this kind of contentment we see in a psalm that we all know very well, Psalm 23, the psalm that David himself wrote. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What is it saying? When the Lord is my shepherd, when I know his staff and his rod is taking care of me, it's covering me, it's protecting me, his presence is with me, I have nothing else to desire because I am content, I am satisfied when my Lord is with me. And I think this psalm very well wraps up this whole passage. Because this passage, again, is not about these three different characters and what they did. Underneath what they have done, what has happened, it is showing the heart, the very heart of our king. The heart of our king that wants to be present with us. And when his presence is with us, there is nothing that we should be wanting. And that is the greatest joy and hope that all believers have, being with the Lord. Isn't that the very promise that God gave from the very beginning of the book of the Bible? From Genesis, he has proclaimed his presence in Eden. And throughout the history of Old Testament, he has multiple times mentioned that I will be your God and you will be my people. My presence will be with you. And that very promise of him has come true, has come true through Christ Jesus in that union that we have with Christ Jesus. His presence we enjoy for eternity. And this is what becomes our hope. This is what We lean on. This is the very foundation of our Christian life. And I want to encourage all of you, all of you who have that baggage that you carry, come to Jesus and taste that very joy that you can only taste when he is present with you. And stride in your life as Christ believers, for his presence will be with you no matter where you go. And given that, ultimate, unconditional love and grace from him. What is there to to be fearful of? There is none. So come to the Lord and taste his grace. Let us all pray.